My wife and I are still searching for a liveaboard catamaran. Our plan is to quit the land-based life and pursue a more rewarding lifestyle at sea. We know we want a catamaran that is suitable for hosting crewed charters in the Virgin Islands for a few years, and a catamaran that is suitable for making ocean passages and is durable enough to get us 10 years of global liveaboard cruising after we are done chartering. It's a challenging search, to say the least. When shopping for used catamarans, you don't always get to compare truly similar boats, so our job seems to be comparing somewhat dissimilar boats against our personal criteria. In this video, I'm comparing a 2021 Fontaine Peugeot Saona 47 to a 2018 Nautitec 46 Open. My wife and I toured both of these boats in the same weekend in the Fort Lauderdale, Florida area, and you will see what we saw. And I also tap into the findings of a fellow YouTuber named Igor Stropnik, who has posted long, in-depth reviews of each of these types of boats, which he made on ocean passage deliveries. I recommend his channel and these videos. I've included links to them in the video notes. The first thing that I like to compare on these two boats are the helm positions. It might seem like a strange place to start, but they certainly impact your experience greatly, and there are functional advantages to both. The Fontaine Peugeot has a flybridge configuration, while the Nautitec Open utilizes split helms on port and starboard. The Fontaine Peugeot flybridge and lounging area on the same deck level is awesome. I discovered from sailing a Lagoon 42 in the British Virgin Islands that the elevated position gives the helmsman a great view of nearby shallow waters when navigating islands and reefs. Being elevated off the water by that much gives you a very comfortable feeling in any kind of sea. The Fountain Peugeot has an attached sun lounging area that would be a lovely place for Emily to sun herself in her bikini or less than her bikini. Of course, maybe that would be a distraction when I should be paying attention to those reefs. One problem I have found with the flybridge helms, particularly ones with the helm offset to starboard or port, is that they can create significant blind spots for both docking and sailing. It's almost impossible to get a good look at your foresail trim from these elevated positions, especially when you're on a broad reach. If the helm is offset to port, it's easier to see your sails on a port tack, but much harder on a starboard tack. Additionally, offset helms on a bridge can create annoying blind spots when bringing the boat to an opposite side tie-off at a dock. It's annoying, but I feel you get used to it and learn where your boat ends and begins with a little practice. Overall, on casual sails through an island group and for short distances, the flybridge is where I want to be. It's just too pleasant to be high above the water with a global view of your boat and your surroundings. You are literally king of the hill. The Nautitec split helm configuration on the main deck level offers different advantages and disadvantages. Having the split helms at the edge of the hulls with full throttle controls at both stations eliminates those docking headaches and gives you the absolutely best look at your approach to a pier or wharf. And I kind of like the steering of this boat. The helm is like the best I have on all these catamarans. It's very, very responsive. So even at low speed, navigating the marina, you turn the helm, uh, the rudder and uh, it just, you know, it works. You can feel the bow, it's like kind of a monohull feel. Like in other catamarans, it was kind of a tank feel, you know, it wouldn't move. So, really thumbs up, I like it. Being on the main deck level keeps you more socially connected with the crew. Having full sail control at both helm stations makes the split helms a much better configuration for viewing your sail trim and actively sailing the boat for optimum performance. I do kind of miss, uh, you know, flybridge. Flybridge is great, you know, just to be up there, hang. Uh, but for performance, uh, this is uh, what you want to have. However, the lower helm doesn't give you the same feeling of comfort in heavy seas or the bird's eye view of your environment. These helms also seem pretty exposed to sun, wind, and rain. I have seen a couple of boats that have added canvas and isinglass enclosures around these helms to help with that. Still, the exposure seems a little greater than with the flybridge. What I still wonder about is which configuration I would prefer in very heavy seas and very strong winds. The bridge would get me above those seas, but do I want to be elevated if the seas are enough to get the boat rolling on the beam? And do I want to be higher in the air with the wind blowing 40 knots? Or would I rather be hunkered down in the main cockpit where I can seek maximum shelter easily while stepping out to check the progress of the boat momentarily. Maybe you've got some experience with this and can share your thoughts in the comments. 
Based on my findings so far, I have to rate helm configuration on these two boats as a tie, since I feel like we would much rather have the bridge while chartering and sailing an island group, but I really like the ease of access to the helm and the better sailing configuration of the split helms while on a passage. Next, I would like to look at what I expect the performance to be for these two boats. Before I get to that, please hit the like button to help others find this video, and please subscribe as well. I'm going to release another video soon, comparing a Sunreef 62 to a Privilege 615, and I'd like you to be notified when it comes out. Now, on to the performance comparison. Two metrics you can grab onto that should hint at how catamarans perform are the displacement to length ratio and the sail area to displacement ratio. I use the word hint because there are so many variables that go into how a boat performs that can yield different results than what these numbers indicate it should be. However, and generally speaking, boats should be faster with lower displacement to length ratios and higher sail area to displacement ratios. Sailboatdata.com reports the Nautitech 46 Open has a displacement to length ratio of 116.8 and a sail area to displacement ratio of 23.82. Cruising World has published a Siona 47 review that includes stats reporting the displacement to length ratio as 140 and the sail area to displacement ratio as 22.4. On paper, the Nautitech seems like it should be a faster boat. After watching Igor Stropnik's video showing his time aboard each boat, I am not so sure that the Nautitech is faster, at least as it's configured. In his videos, it seems as though Igor gets slightly better boat speeds and comparable wind conditions from the Fontaine Peugeot. I'm very suspicious that the reason the Knot Attack was not outperforming the Fontaine Peugeot is because the Knot Attack is configured with a self-tacking jib, with a sheet lead that runs through a car freely moving on the lateral axis of the boat in front of the mast, while the Fontaine Peugeot was configured with port and starboard lead cars on travelers running along the longitudinal axis of the boat which allowed for using larger foresails and offered better trim adjustments. Igor comments in his video about how this configuration is poorly impacting the Nautitech's performance. We have, uh, we have apparent wind uh, angle from the side and the self-tacking just, you know, doesn't work really well. So I have put uh, this rope, the red one, and I'm using both the self-tacking and the red one. And now the shape of the sail, you can see it's a pretty good shape, but without this, it would be just terrible. So self-tacking is, is a disaster. And you don't wanna mess with this all the time. So just like stop putting self-tacking on the boats. The Nautitech we toured also had the same self-tacking head sail, but the broker told us the owner had purchased port and starboard travelers and a larger head sail to improve performance, but the new equipment was not yet installed. However, based on the way these boats were configured at the time we toured them, I think I have to give a slight advantage of performance to this specific Fontaine Peugeot over this specific Nautitech. I base this a little bit on the perceived higher boat speeds experienced by Igor, but I also chose this because the Fontaine Peugeot offers me choices in sail size and setting the angle of attack on the sail that I just would not get with the self-tacking head sail. I think that I could easily reverse my opinion if the new sail leads are installed on the Nautitech. The first two comparisons I have chosen to make for these boats, helm configuration and performance, were intentionally put first to help me make a point I think anyone shopping for a catamaran should keep in mind. The beautiful, nice, high flybridge configurations offered on many cruising or charter catamarans dramatically impact what an architect can do with a sail plan for powering the boat. Having a higher infrastructure for a flybridge typically forces the boom to be higher in the air, and that often results in less sail area being available in the mainsail. For example, Nautitech offers the exact same 46-foot boat in a flybridge configuration called the Nautitech 46 Fly. The 46 Fly has seven square meters less mainsail than the 46 open. Also, the high superstructure often impacts the cut of the headsail and the leads for the sheet because the added superstructure simply gets in the way of a larger headsail. Lastly, the flybridge is adding extra weight, which typically works against the boat's displacement to length and sail area to displacement ratios. 
I don't want to throw a wet blanket on flybridge configurations. I have sailed them. They are awesome. However, everyone should remember that they typically come at a price in both money and performance. We also have to consider how each of these boats might function as a crude charter platform for the earlier part of our plan. In this category, it's clear the Fontaine Peugeot is much better configured for chartering. We felt the private entrance cabin on the aft port hull is ideal for a couple like us who might be hosting crude charters. Aside from having our own separated space and head, we could easily get to deck for early morning and late night operations without creating much of a disturbance for the rest of the crew. However, it had the flexibility for us to move to the bunk bed kids cabin if we happen to have a crew of four couples instead of a larger family with kids. Being able to maximize passenger count on a boat that is only two years old offers a tremendous opportunity for earning top end revenue on charters. The boat is beautifully appointed on the interior and was in like new condition. We know that this Fontaine Peugeot would need very little work, if any work at all, to make it ready for charter. The layout has a great open feel between the cockpit and the main salon. The galley is set up well for preparing meals for large crews, and the lounging areas around the boat are unmatched for a boat of its size. This boat hits all the checkboxes for a charter platform. By contrast, this particular Nautitech simply was not made for the charter industry. With a three cabin layout and maximum sleeping space for six people, this owner's version of the 46 Open would only allow us to host two couples or a family of four. With all that said, and looking at things strictly through the lens of running a charter business, the Fontaine Peugeot wins this category hands down. It's a charter beast, and it's a fabulous boat. When we turn the tables and look at these boats for global blue water cruising, it probably won't be surprising that we get different results. For the same reasons that the Nautitech is not as strong of a charter platform, the Nautitech would offer us much more comfort as a live aboard world cruiser. Although the Nautitech is three years older than the Fontaine Peugeot, the boat is also in like new condition. It's beautiful. It's never been in charter before and only sailed by two couples who shared ownership of the boat. The main salon feels a little bigger than the Fontaine Peugeot. The galley has counter space that is similar to the Fontaine Peugeot, but Emily felt like she could wedge herself into the galley space a little better on the Nautitech. Tight galley space with a lot of countertop might not seem like a desired feature, but your perspective changes if you've ever tried to prepare a meal in heavy seas. It's great to be able to use your legs and hips to pin yourself into place, leaving your hands free for food preparation. Because this particular 46 Open is an owner's version, it naturally blows the Fontaine Peugeot away for cabin accommodations. The master cabin of the port hull is almost like having a small apartment with a spacious bunk area, a separate and private bath and head area, and incorporated desks and counters for doing office work or applying makeup. Don't get me wrong, the Fontaine Peugeot seems to be a very comfortable boat and it would not suck to be cruising the world on a Salona 47. This particular Nautitech would get the nod from us for live aboard accommodations because the Fontaine Peugeot has been specifically laid out for accommodating maximum passengers. Naturally, the cabin spaces and living spaces just feel a little bit tighter on the Fontaine Peugeot. For the category of live aboard sailing and world cruising, I will call the Nautitech the winner when it comes to meeting our overall cruising needs. There is one last and very important category in which I'd like to compare the two boats. Price. At the same time we toured these boats, the asking price on the 2018 Nautitech 46 Open was $690,000. The asking price for the 2021 Fontaine Peugeot Sauna 47 was $1,250,000. Ouch. We looked at the Fontaine Peugeot knowing it was just outside of our upper price range, but we wanted to see what we would get for the extra money. It's a lot. The Sauna 47 is amazing and it blew us away. However, half a million dollars is real money to us and I think we would have to run a heavier charter schedule for a longer period of time to pay off that extra money and we really don't want to be chartering forever. On the category of price, I have to call Nautitech the big winner considering how much boat you get for the dollar. This Nautitech is a fabulous boat at a much more affordable price point. At the end of our tours, we knew that neither of these boats would likely be the boat we would purchase. The Nautitech was very tempting for us, but the owner's cabin configuration just took up too much of the usable space to give us enough flexibility during charter. 
And we also have a large family that we would like to join us occasionally. We just need more bunk space than this particular 46 Open will give us. We would gladly sail the Fontaine Peugeot for charter and for blue water cruising on our own, but the financial burden we would assume would be more than we really want to manage. However, just to declare a winner in this shootout between the 2018 Nautitech 46 Open and the 2021 Fontaine Peugeot Sauna 47, if these were the only two boats we had available to choose between, then we would have to give the nod to the Nautitech 46 Open, based on our specific needs and requirements. The Fontaine Peugeot was undoubtedly the better of the boats, but for the money, the Nautitech 46 strikes us as being the better deal. What do you think? Did you score these two boats differently than we did? If you did, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear what you think. Also, maybe you just have some experience with these two boats, and if you could leave comments letting us know what you experienced, we would greatly appreciate it, and it will help us pick our perfect boat.